coming here really because um, um, this is something we do for our communities local and our satellite communities. Um, we want to do leadership training, but we want to frame it in uh, the Cherokee thinking and, uh, and uh, what that means to us as communities. And so I think uh, Cherokee, when we do things in a Cherokee way, I think it makes us a little bit closer to each other and more cohesive. So that's our, that's our hope anyway. So anyway, thank you all for coming and thank you all for watching online. Um, I'm really excited um, about our guest speaker tonight, Wyman Kirk. He's a good friend. He's someone that has a lot of knowledge. Um, he could speak for certainly more than an hour, but uh, um, he knows about all things language and so many things in terms of culture and uh, and has a, done a great deal of research, but what's really exciting about Wyman is, uh, I think, what he brings through his experiences as well. Many times we have had people come and study us, study Cherokee people um, as outsiders, but uh, Wyman is a local. I mean, he grew up in one of our local communities, and so um, he brings that, that, um, that dynamic uh, to the work as well. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Wyman Kirk. He is an assistant professor at NSU in the Cherokee language program. He lives in Tahlequah but is from Marble City and his wife is Holly Young Kirk and she's an entrepreneur and has two sons, Sonoya, uh, who just graduated from the sixth grade language immersion program and son Roya, who goes to Hulbert Public Schools. And Wyman is finishing up his doctorate in cultural anthropology from Indiana University in Bloomington. And again, he's a strong language advocate and more importantly, a user of our language and our cultural life ways. He's very uh, versed in, in what uh, our cultural life ways mean. And he is also, I, I'm very happy to call him my good friend and uh, Wado Wyman, Wado for being here. Glad to be here, CO. Hopefully I can live up to that introduction. So again, my name is Wyman Kirk. Uh, a little bit more about my background and my, my training and a little bit of what I wanted to talk about tonight. We're gonna cover several topics, some probably more so than others, but I, I did want to get into a range of different ideas. Now, my training is in the field of anthropology, specifically in the area of cultural anthropology. And specifically, specifically within cultural anthropology, I was trained as an ethno-historian. My advisor at Indiana University was a gentleman named Raymond J. DeMalley, who's one of the preeminent experts in terms of the field of ethno-history as well as an expert on the Siouan peoples of the plains. And as a student of his and one who learned under Ray, had and have developed an appreciation for the blending of historical analysis and the way that historians go about looking at these documents of the past to highlight these historical events, these historical peoples, these historical periods, but with the eye of someone who understands or has been trained in terms of looking at cultural patterns, systems, and whatnot, as seen in the field of anthropology, cultural anthropology. Just by luck, I happen to be uh, from Marble City and consider myself to be from and grew up there, went to school there, graduated at Salisaw, actually got my undergraduate at NSU, Northeastern State University, before going to Indiana University. Um, I'll try to, as much as is possible when I talk about things, to give you a sense for where that information comes from. So if I talk about something and it's, say, um, personal experience, I want to be sure that you understand that this perspective that I give is from that or if something I say is from 
oh, one of the, um, one of the, probably the person who's considered the foremost ethno historian, cultural anthropologist with the Cherokee, is a gentleman named Raymond D. Fogelson, recently uh, retired from the University of Chicago. Dr. Fogelson primarily worked with the Eastern Band, but his work does apply to the Cherokees here. I had the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Fogelson and spending some time with him in terms of his ideas and thoughts. So I'll be sure when, if an idea I state comes from somebody else, because a lot of these ideas are, are not mine, they're, they're from people a lot more um, well-versed and intelligent on these topics, I just find that in some of these areas I, I agree. So where to start? Well, you know, we can start with Cherokees in the East in the past. So again, my interest is in this sort of ethno-historical ethno perspective. Let me add that for me, the value of the historic context, the historic picture that we have of Cherokees, is really interesting, but it's interesting in terms of, at least for me, what it says about Cherokee people today. So what I try to do is what I try to find, what I look at, are these pictures in the past and what they can say about people today, Cherokee people today. Now, what we see, as you'd expect, you know, um, is a lot of change. So we've had a lot of change. We've also had some continuity. So those are two themes that will be coming up quite a bit tonight. These ideas of persistence, things that have remained the same, or if not the same, we can understand and see how they have changed, yet remained a part of Cherokee people from this historic picture to today, to, to things that have just outright changed. Things are just fundamentally different in some way, some of them meaningful, some of them not so much. Uh, the question is, you know, how do we make sense of it all? Now, <coughs> we could start from a mythical picture. I, I won't necessarily do that, but we could start from a time period that is so distant, there's not a way to mark it other than sort of uh, Cherokee has a way to, to express the idea of like, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, however, for me, where we'll probably start is late 1600s, early 1700s. One of the reasons is that's whenever we start getting uh, our historical data. Now, one of the cautions I'll say, one of the things that we need to be aware of, if, has anyone ever read any of the old historic accounts. Now, in the late 1600s and early 1700s, we don't get so much traveler's accounts as they are really these boring <laughs> governmental records. Uh, the best set <coughs> probably out there um, are the colonial records of South Carolina. And there are just these records that are sent from these colonial officials from other people involved with the colonial government recording some various details, aspects. Some of them are letters from <coughs> soldiers in the field to the commanders, from colonial officials, the governor at that time, uh, the various governors during this time period and whatnot, from South Carolina and their negotiations, not just with the Cherokees, but other tribes in the Southeast. Some of it's <coughs> interesting, but they weren't really interested in documenting a lot of information. So again, you get these little snippets, and then the rest is really kind of boring. You'll find the term, <coughs> however, interestingly enough, a term that we have today and have had for a long time, the term conjurer. So if you wondered when conjurer was first used with reference to the Cherokees, um, it shows up in the earliest historical materials that, that we have in South Carolina. They were using the term, and they were also using the term sorcerer. <coughs> Excuse me. 
as well. And although they had a very imprecise and actually probably didn't care that much knowledge of Cherokee practices, <coughs> they did have enough awareness to realize at this time you had different classes of people with these different skills, that they were at least using two different terms. Again, there were probably others, but they didn't care to know. So we have those. <coughs> What's really interesting, if you ever get a chance to review these materials, you'll find, again, these snippets of ideas that sound very much modern. I mean, they're things that Cherokee people believe today or adhere to today. I don't know how many people had heard or grew up um, with the idea that you're not supposed to wear the color red during a thunderstorm. And I had heard that growing up. <coughs> I remember being out playing one time. I think we were at Salisaw, maybe, at the park. And I was wearing a red shirt. And my mom's mom, um, Elisa Jigesa, she made me take off my shirt when it started thundering. And I'd heard that, but it, it never dawned on me to ask why or what the issue was. Well, reading <coughs> some of these historical materials, and then if you read, there's a particular myth as well that talks about the thunder who, saves, who is saved by uh, a Cherokee hunter He's fighting the, the hunter, I mean, the thunder is fighting the Cherokee monster, Uktana, and they're struggled in this life and death battle. <coughs> and Hunter comes along, and they both appeal to him to, you know, shoot the other. Thunder prevails and gets the hunter to shoot the Uktan as a reward to the hunter. What he says, when you need me, you just call me, and I'll come. One of the ways you call me is to show the color red. So uh, this thing that I had no idea what it meant when I was 10 years old and had my red shirt taken off of me whenever I was out in a thunderstorm, you know, clearly relates to this idea that if you're wearing red, you're drawing this thunder to you. And unless you have a reason to do so, you obviously wouldn't want to invite that kind of thing. So you'll find a lot of these little nifty little tidbits that pop up. Um, one note of caution regarding historical materials. Obviously, since these are materials that are recorded by outsiders, in some cases very, very attuned outsiders, people who spent some quality time with the Cherokees, who in some cases even got to know the Cherokee language, um, even so, we have to temper some of those ideas we see historically because it's really tough to take a lot of them, <coughs> um, I guess, fully at face value. Not that there's not a lot of value there, but there is a caution. So if you think about in your own situations, in your own families, your own backgrounds, if someone came and observed you, even if it was for a couple of years, could they adequately, accurately describe what was really going on? And they'd probably get a lot of things right, but they'd still miss some important ideas. So even so, we do have this base of information that starts to pop up in the late 1600s, early 1700s, in terms of documents left by these Europeans. And eventually, obviously, once we get to 1775 and after, um, American observations, although by that time we see a drastic change in Cherokee life and Cherokee society. But I'm going to skip over some things, and we'll talk about some other things. So I do want to talk about culture. So let's talk about some of the cultural ideas historically and then today, some of the historical situations and some of the historical or the present day situations and whatnot. <coughs> so obviously today, we're in a situation where Cherokee is a very diverse concept. It's a very widespread idea. So we have Cherokee in terms of, say, identification, in terms of a tribal political unit. 
So if one is a member of Eastern Band, and if I remember correctly, the Eastern Band has actually changed their name to the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation now, and is no longer refers to themselves as the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indian. So if you go on the website, I think it says now Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. Obviously, here in Tahlequah, we have the United Ketua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma and, of course, the Cherokee Nation. And these are these federally recognized political units. Aside from those, we have, in some cases, very contested state recognized units. Uh, I think there's some in Alabama and pretty much states running from here to the east, from Oklahoma to North Carolina. And um, the only thing that I'll say about them is, is, is again, that we have these uh, various um, persons within these organizations, and they are making this claim of, of identity to Cherokee on, obviously, if they're doing it as a state-recognized group, they're doing it on a political level. Of course, we also have Cherokee that we can talk about on these social categories, social levels. Obviously, in the past, Cherokees didn't really have political subdivisions, so we didn't have this issue of different tribes we just had one group that was Cherokee. So in the past, in some ways, in a lot of ways, it's a lot easier to talk about Cherokees. One reason, um, there aren't you know, any 300-year-old Cherokees here to uh, argue against anything we have to say, but, but also because, obviously, Cherokees were at the very least, united in terms of a geographic region. Now, historically, the Cherokees were scattered out in what were several states and in anywhere from three to four distinct geographic areas. These regions seem to be distinct enough and have been in place long enough that they're developed these dialects. So we had different dialects marking different regions historically. <coughs> But in terms of, say, these ideas, these concepts, or anything that we could point to that we could say this is what made someone at this time period Cherokee, what could they be? Well, we could say language was important. So obviously, Cherokee people spoke Cherokee. But we also know that in the southeast, not just with the Cherokees, but with other groups in the southeast, and at this time, the group that we now today know as the Muscogee Nation or the Creek Nation, in this time period, had not yet consolidated in, into such a group. And they were really more these individual towns. So you had um, a common language shared amongst them. But they weren't so much a confederacy until later on. Either way, you had these villages of Muscogean-speaking peoples. And on these border towns that bordered what was the area of the Cherokee Nation and vice versa with these Cherokee border towns, you probably had people who spoke both languages. So obviously, although the language was a strong marker of identity, there were numerous people who spoke Cherokee who were not con Cherokee and did not consider themselves to be Cherokee. So obviously language cannot be an exclusive category. If we look at those, I, I'll call them institutions. Um, in this case, refer to them like social institutions. Um, kinship. So for me, kinship is the place to start. And I think this holds true in the southeast. So this is something we could apply to the Muscogean speak, speaking peoples, the Alabama, um, any of the groups in the southeast, the Delaware, Shawnee. But in the Cherokee case, speaking specifically to the Cherokee, we see this merging of in kinship, 
not just terminology. So when I say kinship terminology, what I mean are the terms people use to refer to someone who was an aunt, uh, an uncle, mother, father, grandparent. Now with the Cherokees and other groups in the Southeast, one of the things, and this is one of the ideas that really was so different that Europeans never actually got a handle on it until probably the early 20th century. It was until this gentleman named uh, Robert Lowy came along and described the Crow kinship system that he actually identified some of the principles. So it took a very long time for Westerners to really understand elements of indigenous, in this case, Southeastern, when South, the primary kinship we associate with the Southeast, which is this matrilineal system. So again, matrilineal being that kinship passes from a mother to her children. So it passes on a mother's line instead of a father's line. This is further, obviously, uh, contextualized by the fact of the clans. So if y'all are familiar with the clans, Cherokee's head have seven clans that are enmeshed in this kinship system. So one of the problems that the Europeans had, they, they had nothing to go by that they could use to understand the Cherokee system because it was so different than anything they had ever seen or experienced, it completely baffled them. In the Cherokee situation and in the other tribes in the southeast, it wasn't just the terms, the terms that were used for various relatives, it was these clan lines that helped to organize the kinship terms. So if you were in, say, uh, Anikawi, the deer clan, you had a set pattern that identified how you would refer to relatives on your mom's side and your father's side. Now because Cherokee clans were exogamous, meaning you didn't marry within them, they were treated separately. So if you think of Western kinship, what we really have is a situation of almost a, you know identical page folded in half. So the only different terms on mother's side and father's side is a term for mother and father. We, we don't refer to father's brother by a different term than mother's brother. They're both uncles. Mother's sister, father's sister, their aunts. Their parents, <coughs> grandfather, grandmother. So we call these types of systems, Western system, bilateral because they're the same on both sides. They don't change. <coughs> The Cherokee system didn't approach it like that. It viewed and approached mother's kin as fundamentally different from father's kin. So it used a completely different system to classify them and organize them. So in this system, we see that the organizing principle were the clans. And so the important clan was obviously one's own clan because that's the one that everything is based. <coughs> if, you, if I would have thought about it, I would have brought some charts that you could see this line and you can see how everything pins to this lineal descent from these women. On father's side, the kin terms are very clearly matched up with my recognition, honoring of my father's clan and the terms that spring off of it. And it's all based off of the clan lines. So, uh, so why is that important? How is that important? Well, if we look historically, there may have been other things that classified Cherokee. But one of the things I would say that was fundamentally, essentially, crucially important to being a Cherokee was having a clan. That you weren't Cherokee if you didn't have a clan. <laughs> How do we know this? Well, again, a lot of the information comes from really secondhand sources. But one of the things we see is there, there is a consistency in these sources, in this information. So, for example, we find numerous examples, instances of individuals who we know were not given clans by Cherokees, 
who, despite the fact, were well liked and had, uh, through time or other means, ingratiated themselves to the Cherokee people, ended up getting killed <laughs> various times. Um, whereas there are certain individuals who we find indications were given clans and were protected. So there's a couple of specific instances we have. Not a lot, but enough, I think, to sort of indicate or at least tell that if a person were given a clan, had a clan, then they were protected from being killed because if someone hurt me, say if I was adopted into a clan or not, or if I was adopted into a clan, that I would be protected because those clan rights, so remember, if, if you all know a little bit about the clans, one of the principles was that if someone in my clan is killed or injured as a clan, particularly starting with, say, the closest family members of the person who was killed or injured, has the right to basically equal retribution to whatever clan was responsible for the death. So if I were Deer Clan and Wolf Clan killed one of the members of our clan, then we're owed a life from somebody from the Wolf Clan. So if you think of the principle eye for an eye. So we see a lot of the Europeans categorize this as an eye for eye concept. It was a little different. It wasn't quite the same, but it, it did have some of the same connotations associated with it. <coughs> so persons who had a clan, were given a clan, were then protected, just like any other Cherokee. So anything that happened to someone who was a member of the clan would happen to whoever, um, someone in the offending clans category, if that makes sense. So again, if we look at the big picture, there are other things that marked being Cherokee. Residents in a Cherokee settlement, language, particular behaviors. Uh, we can talk about ceremonial practices. We can talk about religious beliefs. But in a lot of those categories, there's a lot of similarities. So we can talk about how very similar practices were between, say, Creek and Cherokee on almost all levels. So to me, the one consistent, unique identifier, at least in terms of its individual capacity, was the clans, was kinship. And that to be Cherokee, whatever else may be involved, to be Cherokee meant to have a clan. So what's interesting is, Let's talk about today. <clears throat> um, can we say, can we look at the clan, can we look at kinship as a category that captures everyone who is Cherokee in the same way? And the answer is no, no, obviously not. The, the ch things have changed. So in this historic picture, if I didn't know anything else, so this is what's interesting, I didn't know anything else, had this picture and you know, 1700 of Cherokee life. If you would have said in 2014, the kinship system and the clan system would be fundamentally different than it was at this period, 1700. I would have been tempted to say, well, then I don't know if Cherokee people exist because, you know, I mean, this seemed to be the springboard for Cherokee life. What I didn't get into in this system with the clans historically is that we see the clans play an integral role, not just in terms of kinship, but they're dominant in almost all areas of social life as well as political life. So we see people sitting in the council chambers by clan. We see members elected essentially into this political body, the political bodies that the Cherokees had, by clans. Social activities and organizations in the ceremonial cycle were organized and dictated and run by clans. So the clans permeated Cherokee life on almost every single level historically. 
were so fundamentally important, you needed to know a clan, have a clan, or have an affiliation to a clan to really be able to operate within Cherokee society. But obviously, something happens, something changes, and that linchpin disappears, and yet we find Cherokee people are still here and still very much Cherokee. They're not any less Cherokee today than they were 200 years ago, 300 years ago. So there's a couple of things there that, that are really interesting. One is, as important as the clans were, it also means that there was much more to Cherokee life and Cherokee society than that particular institution. Now again, there are uh, Cherokees today who very much adhere to and follow and utilize the clans in their social and ceremonial activities, so it's not to discount that, but there are individuals who are every bit as Cherokee who do not. So the, the point is to say that at least today, there is not that single way we can talk about Cherokees. There are multiple ways that we have to talk about Cherokee. So Cherokees, at least as a people, have become much more diverse in terms of, say, the institutions that mark them, both politically, socially, religiously, um, and what have you. So <clears throat> let's step back and we'll step forward again. So one of the things we see historically in place are these um, stories. So myths and stories that were told historically, some of which are still told today, but historically they had a very particular purpose. So how many people have heard a Cherokee myth? You know, so we've, you know, there's tons of them that have been recorded. How many have heard them in Cherokee? So one of the interesting phenomena we've had is these stories which were all originally, historically in Cherokee, got transitioned to English. Now, M Mooney had a lot to do with that, with his work with the Eastern Band in the 1900s, where he, you know, the myths of the Cherokee was published, and also, um, much later on, the loss of Cherokee as a dominant language um, for Cherokee people, and a lot of these stories being framed in, in English and what have you. Um, there's something to be said about what the significance is between the stories given in Cherokee and the stories in English. Uh, we may or may not have time to address or whatnot. What I'm more interested in getting at is that, let's, so let's, let's talk about some of these stories today. So we have these stories that have, so we can talk about these as enduring category, some of these stories, a lot of these stories. But what's interesting is today they kind of occupy a space of their own. You know, so we have these stories, but that's really where they're kept, these, these Cherokee stories we have. But if we look historically, we look in the past, stories were actually told and kept and guarded by really persons who were involved in the religious and ceremonial cycle. And the reason was that these stories meant more than just, you know, stories that told of, say, origins of how particular animals look, how they look today, or of these incidents in this mythical past. There are keys within the stories that highlight certain principles and ideas related to what was the um, Cherokee view of medicine, medicine on a practitioner and sacred level and something that was really not to be utilized by your average Cherokee. The people who were supposed to utilize and take advantage of that and, and know that information were Cherokees who had apprenticed or were apprenticing to be medicine persons or otherwise involved in that ceremonial institutional cycle. So these stories were linked to lots of other ideas that were known by this select group of, of, of trained Cherokees in, in the ways of medicine. So medicine, today who we would identify as medicine people, and the knowledge they contain and the way they attain that knowledge 
was part of a larger system of knowledge that historically included these stories. So the stories were much more valuable, much more applicable to a lot of different ideas for Cherokees then than maybe so today. And not to discount the value of, of Cherokee stories today, um, it's just say they, they really occupy different areas of Cherokee life. I, I mean, today, I usually don't hear stories unless it's in a kind of public and group setting where you're hearing about Cherokee stories, you know, maybe out at the Heritage Center or out at these other things. I don't hear them so much, for example, say in um, family settings or places like that. It, it, some of the, the grounds, I think, will still tell some of the stories and whatnot. So it's not that they've completely disappeared from the religious area. But by and large, when you hear these stories, they're, they're really um, in these either tourist-type venues or tourist-type situations. And again, that is not to devalue them in any way, because I, I do think they're, they're wonderful stories, but they just occupied a different area of knowledge. So we have had some of this other change. Um, I'm going to pause. I want to see if anybody has any questions before I go on and do a time check. I don't know what time it is. Again, I can go on and on. There's a joke about going on until like 2 o'clock in the morning, and unfortunately, I, I could live up or live down to that reputation. Now, it's 636. Okay. Uh, so we have a little time. And you mentioned those documents earlier, so maybe we can, if you don't mind, maybe we can post those later. Yes, we'll yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, does anybody, do I have any questions out here? We have a microphone not to put anybody on the spot. If not. I have a question. Yes. Since you've been from Marvel City, did you ever know of a conjurer and medicine man being the same guy? Yes. So the question was, I don't know if people online could hear, was whether or not the a conjurer, term conjurer applied to a person, and the term medicine man could relate to the same person? And the answer is, is, is yes. And it depends on really one's perspective of that person. What, what one man's conjuring is another man's uh, love doctor, I guess. I don't know. Um, a lot of it depends on really what type of medicine is being used. So, for example, um, it's well known that there are these love charms that can be used to attract persons of the opposite sex, and that medicine persons can be consulted in this process, and that medicine has been used to try to attract another person even in situations where they might be married. And as long as nobody finds out, the medicine man is, is OK. But if someone finds out, the, say, woman or man in question, you know, then they're accused of, of conjuring or conjuring. And so it, it can be applied to a person. Again, depends on, I guess, which side of fence you are. If you're the one hiring someone to do the matchmaking, or if you're on the other side, I guess you'd feel like you're being conjured or whatnot. Um, in cases involving more, shall we say, diabolical types of medicine, um, it's, it's much more infrequent. Or if, if, it's, if it's done, it's much more secretive. Because certainly, in terms of medicines that would harm individuals, either very seriously chronically or even in terms of, say, say, death magic or what kinds of things have you, you know, no one would own up to that kind of practice, even if they did. And certainly it's something since there, you know, if, if you've seen some of the materials that have been published, there is a healthy literature on Cherokee medicine that has been published. Now, there's arguments about the accuracy 
and validity of the formulas, as they're called, that's found in Mooney's work. But what I think is a way to look at that material without having to look at the particular formulas is look at the system in place. How did Cherokees go about, how did Cherokee people view medicine? How did they treat, you know? So there really was this system in place, almost like a doctor has, of looking at causes and finding treatments based on sort of this, I don't know if you want to call it a cosmological chart, but a way of looking at things, cause and effect. One of the interesting, so we talk about culture, you know, a lot of times we end up talking about things, and things are certainly part of culture. Baskets, pottery, stickball sticks, uh, the, the tear dress, all these, these are parts of culture. But equally as parts of culture, yet much harder to identify are these ideas and these concepts and these practices we have. With Cherokees and peoples in the southeast, we have what really seems to be, especially Cherokees, I think on the extreme end of that, a very subtle type of culture in place. And it's been an issue at times in terms of, say, our youth and competing with you know, culture in terms of more grandiose displays and whatnot, but certainly with, with Cherokee people and whatnot, we have some of these ideas that are in place, one of them being this notion of accountability. So you go see a medicine man, one question you will most certainly get is, okay, what did you do? <laughs> and there's a notion of intentional or not, accidental or not, you, oneself, had something to do with one's situation. It doesn't mean that you had necessarily done something overly wrong, but in some way, some manner, you had done something to offend either someone else or do something that has created the situation that you're in. And this notion is repeated, we find in these cultural themes throughout Cherokee history. So if you know of Redbird Smith and the revitalization of the ceremonial cycle in the late 1800s, whenever allotment was on the horizon, that with these members who broke, you know, we had the Katua Society, and it really kind of split in terms of how they approached their opposition to allotment. The one group that went with Redbird Smith viewed that they had lost their way spiritually and that these things that were happening to them as Cherokee people was partially their fault, was partially their responsibility for having lost their way spiritually. And as part of the way of fixing things, they had to get back to their older way of life in terms of their ceremonial cycle and whatnot. And that's why the ceremonial grounds and ceremonial cycle was revitalized at that time under that. It was seen as an aspect and part of the resistance to allotment and what have you. But again, the underlying idea was a sense of responsibility and accountability for, for this. My, a brother who's a year older than me works at Hastings Hospital, and he says he can tell when some of these, um, especially older Cherokees come in, is, is that they're much more willing, or Cherokee people who have this perspective are much more willing and, off, and, and do take responsibility for their health situation. So if they are in very ill health, they aren't looking for a quick fix. They understand that their situation, whatever it be, uh, be it diabetes, uh, health problems, um, heart disease, whatnot, um, are a product of their own making in their situation. So it's a lot different when you encounter some other people who um, have difficulty accepting responsibility and also in terms of treatment wanting a, a quicker fix to things. So it's real interesting. So there is this idea that's there. So these cultural notions. Now we can look at other culture patterns and ideas and wonder what to make of them. So if you go out and if you're 
say, somewhere. So n next time you're in a, a real cold weather situation, you have a lot of people wearing gloves, you'll notice that the Cherokees will tend to take off their glove to shake your hand. Now, my dad's side is not Cherokee, and I tell you, at least for them, um, you see somebody and it's cold, you got your glove on, you can, it's okay to shake with your, with your glove on, they don't think anything of it. On my mom's side, you run into people and it's just natural, people take off their gloves, shake, shake your hand uh, for the Cherokees. Why is that? What does that mean? Well, it's not this, this, this you know, grand meaningful gesture, but it does have a significance. Um, you ask people, and a lot of times they'll say, well, that's you know, just how we do it. You drill down a little bit more, and they say, well, it's just a sign of respect for the other person, that you're, you know, it's to actually touch, you know, the flesh of the other person is, is a deeper sign of respect than just with the glove or whatnot. And so are these practices and ideas. Um, so let me pause again. Are there any other questions? What or who determines who would be a medicine man? So, okay, so the question was what or who would determine who would be a medicine man? There's, there's a little debate about this, there's a little discussion, but fundamentally, I think there is agreement about a lot of the process. And there are three ideas that I need to address. So in becoming a medicine person, one is that in Cherokee society, historically, as well as today, this notion of power, power that is accumulated that exists in the world, that in Cherokee conceptions of these things, Cherokee notions, in general, power is, what I'd use the term, is very diffuse, it's very weak. Now we can contrast this, say, with like some of the Plains group, where power is this very accumulatable type of concept where individuals, especially men, can go on these vision quests to acquire not only power, but power that is particular and specific to them. So a person can get like, you know, and I, by no means am I anywhere near an expert of, of, of the plains or any place else. But as I understand it, one uh, supplicates himself to be pitiful. And if they're fortunate enough, they're bestowed this power that is theirs and theirs alone that they keep and guard. Um, in the Cherokee vantage point, that would never happen because there's not a vehicle or mechanism in place to ask for and be bestowed power in any of that kind of way. That one of the principle, one of the core principles in terms of Cherokee medicine, as I see it, is the notion of apprenticeship. So there is an understanding of individuals maybe having been called to it having been identified to be a medicine person, but unless that person chooses, and so this is one of the differences in, in Cherokee conceptions, at least as I understand it, one has to, still has the choice to say no, no or, ye or yes, to be a medicine person. And that if they say yes, it's, it's not an automatic thing, is that they do have to apprentice for a number of years before they are actually a medicine person. So one of the, the main characteristics in Cherokee medicine, at least for Cherokee medicine people, is the fact that you have to train to do this. And um, we can see some of this reflected in the language. So one of the words, one of the words that's used to describe, say, the power of a medicine man is directly derived from the verb that means to know how to do something. So this word for power of a medicine man really means know-how. So there's a lot of stuff there that indicates this is actually a learning process. Now again, there's an understanding that some people have 
you know, maybe a, a gift for it, a stronger capacity, ability. But it does them no good unless they've been trained to actually use it. And having been trained by another person who's a medicine person willing to train them and teach them these things. So um, that's, that's the second part. And then the, the third thing is that there are persons and things that do have either unusual pieces of power for various tobacco. Tobacco is seen to have, it's, it's really seen as more of a vessel for power that can hold stuff. Maybe not so much um, in terms of, I, the, the way I would view it, is it, it's something that can be infused with, with power, good or bad intentions. But until then, it's kind of empty. Running water has power. Um, there are certain times, apparently, that medicine can be done to infuse it with greater power. So like uh, going out at uh, the deepest part of night, uh, around midnight, to do medicine can make the medicine stronger and more powerful. But, but these, are, these are things that are accessible to everybody. So again, one of the key things is that notions of power, not just medicine, for medicine people, but notions of, of power and accessibility to these things are open to everybody. Everybody has some degree of access to them. Again, some people have more of a gift for it, but everybody has an ability to, to utilize it in some way, although again, it, it's very diffuse and weak, certainly not as in the same way as we see again with some of the planes or other groups. Does that answer the question? So, um, um, maybe the, the last thing I can get into is to talk about very briefly, again, started off talking about how historically not only did we have a place that we could identify as Cherokee, but some particular characteristics, social organization in the clans for one. But one of the interesting phenomenon we see with Cherokees, and I haven't heard or seen it with other groups, even in the southeast, is that Cherokees were not afraid to take off and go different places. So even historically, there were myths of a Cherokees, of these Cherokee groups who had headed out west and were presumed to have died and disappeared, but apparently had been encountered at some point in the early 1800s um, by the Rocky Mountains and whatnot. And we find various instances. There's this gentleman named John Norton who was a, if I remember correctly, he was really raised by the Mohawk, but his mother was Cherokee. He was taken during a raid, but he actually became a British officer. <laughs> there was a journal of his that was published when he uh, must have been in his 30s left, and he, he may have been in Canada somewhere, left, he wanted to find his mom and his mom's family. So he ventured down to Cherokee country. And this journal is just his account of his uh, chronicling of his adventures. One of the things he finds are number of Cherokees and uh, Cherokee settlements of Cherokees who just left. Not for any particular reason. He just encounters them on the way. So we also find note historically of Cherokees. Now again, before 1800, and probably not even until 1820, Cherokees did not identify politically with, say, a Cherokee nation or a political body. So their identification of themselves to, say, this notion of Cherokee would have been on a completely different level. There wasn't a, a sense of, of tie that they had, <clears throat> say, like today we would have with the Cherokee Nation or even some of these other um, concepts and ideas. And so we find numerous examples of Cherokees who just decide to take off, either individually or in small groups and small families. I think this accounts for the fact that we see Cherokees more widespread than 
other tribes, other groups as well, that there was something about the Cherokee system in place and uh, didn't get a chance into it. One of the other concepts I think that has endured is this notion of autonomy, individual autonomy that individuals had. A lot of what we'd say, one might call it um, individual freedom. I, I would still use the term autonomy because uh, freedom is such a loaded term in terms of what it means. But regardless, however you view it, Cherokees, you know, left and spread out and went different places. And some of them came back and some of them didn't. But that's not a phenomenon. We, we, we don't, I don't hear accounts of, say, Creeks or Shawnees or Siouan peoples just saying, hey, what's over that mountain? Let's go check it out. Let's go over there. With Cherokees, they do. I mean, somebody says, you know, there's a lot of people I don't know moving here. Let's, let's take off. Let's, you know, let's go that way. And, and they do. So it's really remarkable. And again, it separates them because we don't see that so much again with other members in the Southeast. So it seems to be a particular Cherokee characteristic or a Cherokee trait. Once we get into the 1800s, Cherokees start to identify with their government and with their tribal government. So we see a little bit more of an association and an unwillingness to leave once we get into the 1830s, 1840s, and whatnot. But you still find individuals, especially when we had the conflicts between the Old Settler Treaty Party and the forced removal Cherokees in terms of wanting to separate, but not really so much move off. Now, there was the group that went to Texas and then tried to immigrate to Mexico, but the government uh, actually forced Mexico to send them back. A story for someone else to tell another day. So any, any last questions? Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting. We can almost trace it in three different types of, of movement categories. So there were the Cherokees who took off before the Treaty of Nudia Chota, probably pre-1830. So Cherokees who moved really voluntarily to places elsewhere. Most of them were what we come to know as the old settlers. Um, and those individuals, obviously the era of removal um, and the Cherokees and the Cherokee populations that resulted from that. The Civil War displaced a lot of Cherokee people. Pretty much most Cherokee people uh, went north, in some cases south, but most of them north. And some of them did not return after the Civil War. We had Cherokees move west um, for economic reasons prior to allotment. And then the government's relocation program. Um, my mom has a sister and her husband, who's actually a uh, Pawnee, who live in Dallas and ended up out there as part of the relocation program back in the, I believe it was 60s, late 60s or whatnot. So, yeah, um, and now today, obviously, Cherokees pop up everywhere and are connected in different ways. Well, thanks. I appreciate getting an opportunity to be here tonight and to talk. And I don't consider myself to be the authoritative expert, so any errors, mistakes, and omissions, I apologize for. And if someone knows the better, please feel free to shoot me a line. I work at Northeastern State University. So you can find me there. Feel free if you want any more information or anything um, to you know, ask me, and I'll, I'll share anything I have, both in terms of language as well as uh, anything else. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Widow Wyman, we really appreciate your being here.
and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us. Uh, I just want to point out uh, also that um, in the fall, there is a course that takes place through the Cherokee Heritage Center called the Cherokee Humanities Course. That's on Monday evenings from 6 to 9, I believe. And Wyman is the professor that uh, he, he teaches a lot of the history and culture there. Uh, Ryan, who spoke last month, uh, does an hour of language, and then they move into the, the history and culture. But, um, but that's a free uh, course as well, Monday evenings from 6 to 9, and it will probably start again in August. So if you're interested yeah. in that, it's a really good course. They have take some neat field trips and have some neat special guests as well. So, it, so look for that. Yes, it has. Um, anyone is free to sit in on the class, so mm -hmm. you don't have to make any arrangements and all. You can show up. It is also, however, available for individuals to take as college credit oh, wow. through okay. NSU. You should contact. Uh, Tanya, Tanya Hogner Weevil, Hogner -Weevil at, at mm -hmm. the Heritage Center yeah. for details about that. And the credits are from and through Northeastern State University. It will not show up if you're looking on Northeastern's site. Because of the nature of the class, it is all managed. And it's a secret course in NSU system. It, it has to be <laughs> taken through the Heritage Center. So if one's interested in that or just participating, it is on NSU schedule. So the first class, I should know when our first class, when we start back up, but it'll be on NSU schedule in terms of classes, but it, it will be every Monday night. Again, mm -hmm. like Donnie said, six o'clock till I think 840 technically, although mm -hmm. we always end up running over to yeah, like nine yeah. or nine. They have snacks They have too. snacks and stuff. <laughs> and again, it's, it's free and open. To people who want to just come in and sit, mm -hmm. however, if you are interested, in, uh, it's intended as a gateway course for people either interested in going back to college or if you just want the college credit. They have up to 20 seats, and usually mm -hmm. it's not a problem getting most mm -hmm. people any want to take it for, for credit. Again, contact mm -hmm. Tanya for, for that, mm -hmm. and we can provide you, obviously, any information you need if you're interested. All right. Okay. We're going to end for the evening. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you all, everybody watching online. Wyman, thank you so much for coming in. Widow. We may be on for just a bit. <laughs>